There are a lot of new faces here today. Thank you so much for coming out and joining us. My name's Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at Newbridge Church, and I'm grateful that you chose to spend your Sunday with us. We've been going through a sermon series called Choosing the Narrow Path, and we're looking at the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And I think that this is one of the most transformational passages in the entire Bible. I have seen so many people as they, they dive deep into the Sermon on the Mount who are changed by Jesus' words. And uh, it's, it's a lot in a few words. And so we're trying to mine this for as much as we can. And because of that, we've curated a, uh, some questions, some, some things for you to reflect on. If you go to newbridgenj.com slash narrow path, you can find our companion guide for the sermon series. And you'll find the messages as they're preached, a summary of the message so you can kind of get out some of the main points, and then some questions for reflection. Something for you to work through on your own, with your family, uh, with friends, your small group if you wanted to do that, uh, or even someone that's trying to figure out what does it mean to follow Jesus. Um, and so we hope that that's useful to you. We'd love to hear if you're getting something out of it. Um, I, I love that Tim, Pastor Tim, eased us into the Sermon on the Mount. I love that he took a week to set up the whole thing. And then even last week, as he, he reminded us that Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples. Matthew 5, 1 says, Now Jesus saw the crowds... And he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. So he was specifically talking to those few people that he had chosen. And undoubtedly the crowds gathered around and wanted to hear what this Jesus had to say. Because at this point, Jesus' popularity is starting to grow. He's been preaching about the kingdom of heaven and what it looks like when that, that kingdom invades earth. And he's been teaching about his father in heaven, the king of everything. And he's also started to heal people. And this is what's really getting people's attention. In Matthew chapter four, it talks about this, how, how people have started talking about this Jesus who is healing people. And so Jesus is becoming known and he sits down with his disciples and he says to them, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus would go on and talk about a little bit more challenging things than the Beatitudes, about if somebody steals from you, well, give them a little bit more. If somebody slaps you in the face, turn your cheek and let them slap you again. When the oppressors ask you to do something, go above and beyond and even farther than they've asked you to. And I've talked to so many people who, who say that they take the Bible literally. I'm like, well, what do you think about the Sermon on the Mount? And they're like, well, Jesus didn't really mean that. Like, what are you talking about? This is, this is the passage that Jesus gets done at the end. And he says that if you hear my words and put them into practice, you're like a man who has built his house on a rock. The winds and the waves come and crash against it and it stands. But if you hear my words and you do not put them into practice, you're like a man who builds his house on the sand. And when the wind and the waves come, it crumbles. And I think this was an incredibly challenging teaching for his disciples. The other day, Thursday, uh, I went to a a round table on preaching. So there were seasoned preachers and teachers of preachers who were talking about the art of preaching. And they were giving advice and they're, the way they do things. And there was one man who said something and I was like, I need to follow up on this. I'm, I'm curious about this very thing that you're talking about. And, and so I patiently waited until lunch and somebody got to him before me. 
So I patiently waited for that person to finish. And I knew at this point he's ready for lunch. And I was like, hey, I, I know that lots of people want to talk to you. Can I just ask you this one question? And so he invited me to go stand in line with him. And we waited in line. I asked my question. He gave me an answer. It was great. Then he started talking to somebody else. I started talking to somebody else. And I was grateful that he had given me that amount of time. And then from behind me, I hear, hey, Brian, we're going in. I'll save you a seat. And I immediately perked up. It's like, oh, did anybody else hear that I just got invited to this man's table? That I'm going to get to sit with him and pick his brain a little bit longer? I think that's what the disciples are kind of feeling. They are feeling the celebrity of Jesus because they're so closely associated with him. And so Jesus sits them down and says, this is what I'm really about. I'm about service. I'm about sacrifice. Now, if the Sermon on the Mount isn't challenging to us, I'm not sure that we're reading it and taking Jesus' words seriously. It's about giving ourselves up and what we want. There's nothing in here about our rights. There's nothing in here about power or celebrity or gaining status. It's all about choosing to empty ourselves and give ourselves up. And I think that, that he's having this conversation with the disciples. This, this is very much a defining the relationship conversation. Jesus is saying, this is what I'm about. And if you want to be about me, this is how you're going to have to live because Jesus lived this out perfectly. And so it could seem that as we're, as we're reading this, knowing that in our hearts there is pain, knowing that there are things going on, that we lose jobs, we, we have to move away from loved ones, we, we harm relationships that we're in, and we lose loved ones. We're all dealing with all this stuff. And as I read it, I'm like, Jesus, are you really making it harder for me? Because this isn't easy. I mean, even the one that we're looking at, at today, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. I mean, in its most simple translation, you could say, happy are the sad because they're going to be happy. I don't know about you, but I have never been sad and thought, oh good, I'm gonna be happy soon. That's not how I work. I am in my emotions and I am feeling what I'm feeling or trying to avoid it and trying to feel other things. I'm not thinking about how I'm going to be comforted. I need comfort now. And yet this is what, what Jesus says. It's interesting to me, as I was doing my research this week, I realized that nearly all the English translations translate the Greek to mourning. The Greek word could be translated both mourning and grieving, and yet they choose mourning. Grieving is the inward feeling when we lose something. We lose something extremely valued, the grieving process takes much longer. If it's a person, it can take years, and sometimes we never fully get over the loss, and I'm not sure that we should be trying to get over the loss of a person. Um, but when we mourn, mourn is the outward expression of the inward feelings that grief has caused. And so the New Testament translators almost across the board are saying there's an outward aspect to what Jesus is saying here that we're not supposed to just keep our grieving to ourselves, but, but blessed, happy are those that share their grieving with other people. Now, I grew up in America, majority culture, and I can tell you what, my experience with grieving is that I was never really taught how to do it. Some of you I know grew up in other cultures, in other countries, and you may have a totally different experience with grieving, but I can only share what I've learned. Now there's the, the moment of silence when there's a national tragedy before a, a sports game, which seems both way too short because it doesn't give us enough time to actually process what we're grieving together, and it's all too long because we don't know how to grieve and mourn together, and so we stand there awkwardly waiting for somebody to call out, play ball. 
probably the most prominent form of, of, of mourning in our country is the funeral or wake, celebration of life, whatever your, your community, whatever your family calls it. You know, we typically put on dark clothing unless the family has asked us to wear something else. And we go, we, we give hugs, we give our condolences, we might send a, a flower or a card. But once the day's over, we go our way and the family is left trying to figure out how to grieve this deep loss on their own. And so I've not grown up with a framework for what this looks like. You know, honestly, when, when I'm in a, a place that uh, I'm, I'm upset that I'm grieving, I try to avoid it. Anger is so much better than sadness, is it not? Anger makes us feel powerful. It gets things done. It puts people in their place. Those that have wronged us, they better watch out. The problem with anger and why it doesn't replace grief and mourning is anger goes after the what and why of what happened. It doesn't deal with the actual loss. Grieving and mourning are there for us so that we can sit in the tension of what we have lost and the pain that that is causing us. If it's a, a job we lost, we, we have to mourn that we don't get to go in. Maybe it was a dream job and you thought everything was going great and it turned into a nightmare. Your boss is a narcissist, he lies about you, lies to other people about all sorts of things. You have to take the time to actually process, this is what I have lost, not just the behavior of another person. If it's someone that you loved dearly, a friend, you have to take the time to actually mourn the fact that you don't get to go out for coffee with them anymore. You're not gonna sit and have conversations anymore. That person, that thing, that opportunity is gone. It is lost forever. That's what grieving does for us. It's not about fixing the problem. It's existing in that moment with our feelings. And I know that's really difficult for a lot of us. You know, not only do I feel like I wasn't taught how to mourn well, I also was incredibly emotional as a teenager. I cried a lot. I'm still a crier and I'm okay with it now. You just have to know you're gonna have to deal with some tears with me once in a while. But for a high schooler, that's a dangerous thing. There's not a lot of other high schoolers that treat you with kindness and love when you start crying in front of them. Yeah, it's tricky. But ultimately, I think in the United States, the way we look at grieving and mourning is that it's an interruption. It gets in the way of our life. It gets in the way of our productivity. Isn't that what America's all about, getting as much done as we can, as quickly as we can, with excellence and efficiency? And grieving completely throws that away. It might cause us, if we have a coworker that's grieving, to complain that they're not carrying their weight anymore. It might feel like to us who are grieving that we, we don't have a place because we just don't have the mental energy and the capacity to do what we think we're supposed to do when I think the invitation from Jesus is to actually take the time to sit in the pain. When I was looking at our preaching schedule and realized I was teaching on this, I was like, there's gotta be an easier beatitude for me to teach, isn't there? which probably means that there's still some of this work that I need to do in my own life. It's an ongoing process, and, and I think that we get into trouble when we expect it to be done in a certain time frame. And each person, each situation is a different time frame. You know, most scholars, when they look at, at this verse, and I shouldn't say most, there's a lot of scholars that look at this and they're like, what Jesus is talking about is our spiritual losses, our sin, our brokenness. And I think those are great things to take the time and grieve and mourn together in, to, to really examine ourselves and, and our behavior. But I think that if we look at the Sermon on the Mount as only spiritual, 
that we're missing out on so much of what Jesus has for us. Because the kingdom of God is not just something that affects the spiritual, it affects the physical. Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. He also took bread and fish and multiplied it. He healed people. When the kingdom of heaven comes, it doesn't just affect us internally, our spirit, our soul. It should be affecting the community as well. In Isaiah 61, which is one of my favorite passages about Jesus in the Old Testament, and you'll hear Pastor Tim and I quote it all the time because like, we both just love it. Um, but it talks about all these things that Jesus is going to do. But then it moves on from there. And those that have been affected by Jesus, it says, the righteous will go on and they will rebuild the ancient ruins. The place is long forgotten. Now, the people of God... When we spend time with Jesus, when we start to look like Jesus, we ought to be affecting the physical as well as the spiritual. We ought to be the ones going into devastated communities and being the ones leading the way at rebuilding them. And while we're there, allowing the people that have been suffering the time and the space to grieve and to mourn. So let's, as we continue to move forward in the, this series, continue to look not just at the spiritual aspects, but how it should affect the, world's, the world around us. Because I really believe that if we do not mourn our losses in life, we'll stagnate spiritually, and that leads to all sorts of relational problems. It affects people around us. I've been following the stories of, of two pastors who have been removed from, from their positions. One was, uh, I guess, in the category of a celebrity pastor. I had never even heard of him until he made national news. The other was someone whose teaching I sat directly under. I knew his family. I interacted with him directly. And both of them were removed because they, um, they had affairs. And so both are, are tragic stories. But as they've been going through the healing process, as they've come to terms with what they have done, the people they've hurt, and they've, they've worked actively to save their marriages, both of them said that in their past, there were moments of tragedy. One was assaulted as a young man and didn't have the tools to work through it. He said, that led to patterns of behavior in my life that ultimately led up to what I did. The other lost a grandchild, the same thing. He said, I never took the time to grieve the losses. Now, neither of these men have blamed their behavior on what happened to them in the past, but they did say, because I didn't deal with this, it led to all sorts of maladaptive behavior in their lives. They're a warning sign for us. If we don't deal with what's going on in our past, our pain in the present, that we will not continue to grow as we move forward. We might learn behavior. We might learn what's expected of us as a follower of Jesus, but behind closed doors, our souls are aching and they're in pain. But I take comfort in the fact that in Psalm 40, uh, 34, it says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, that he rescues those in anguish. Because sometimes we don't really know how to interact with each other when we're grieving. Right? It's, it's, it's difficult unless you are from a, a culture that, that allows for that. See, the people Jesus was talking to in this moment, they understood grieving. The people of Israel were under Roman occupation. But going back all the way into the Old Testament, you see these patterns of grieving where people would, would tear their clothes, they would put on sackcloth, they'd put ashes or dust on their head, and then they would go into the public spaces and sit there. And every person that walked past them would know that this person is in mourning. They're not hiding. They are, are moving into the public place so that everyone that walks past them has to confront what is going on, that something tragic has happened. And quite often it was the prophets that were doing this and they were in, in the public space because God had a message for the people. But you also see this just with the brokenhearted. 
They had a practice of putting themselves out rather than hiding. And I believe that this is Jesus' invitation for us because he's saying, look, I am close to you already. I am close to you in your pain. And church, what this means for us is those that are in a good place, we have to be willing to mourn with those who mourn. Just as we get to celebrate with those who are celebrating, we have to be ready and prepared to come alongside people. And that's the trickiest part for some of us. I, I was... Uh, I ran into somebody I know this week and I, I asked him how they were doing and he said, not good, sorry, but I'm not doing good. And I just immediately said, man, I, I'm so grateful for your honesty. Thank you for being honest. Thank you for, for sharing what's really going on rather than, than not being honest with me. And I think the main reason why we don't share our grief with people is because most of us have had horrible experiences with terrible comforters. The Holy Spirit is the comforter, but church, he loves to use his people. Every time there's brokenness in the world, he is inviting his church into a place of being a part of that healing. And so he wants to use us in, in the ministry of comfort. My wife and I had 10 years of infertility. And, uh, you know, there's a monthly reminder that what we desire isn't happening. And we would constantly go up for prayer and at least for a while. But then we, we stopped because we got tired of, of hearing things like, you know, Sarah was 90 years old when she had her first kid. Like, we don't want to wait that long. We've already feel like we've waited too long. Please don't pray for me. <laughs> or, you know, New Yorkers love to say things like, well, it could be worse. <laughs> How does that help? It is what it is. But I don't want it to be what it is. There's something that is missing, something I am longing for. And I'm in pain because of it, and you're just adding to my pain. We've probably all been there before. Or people want to fix us. They see us as a problem because when we're not open and ready to receive hurting people, they're an interruption. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where, where you're in pain and somebody just tries to explain it away. It's the Lord's will. It might be the Lord's will, but you're not helping me accept it right now. You're actually putting, putting something between me and God because I have been asking him to do something different. And friends, we don't always actually know what the Lord's will is. We can look at our broken world and we see things happening that when we look at the Bible and what Jesus has called us to, we know are not the Lord's will. Look, I am I'm a full believer in the total supremacy, the total sovereignty of God. But he also loves us, whether we love him or not. And so he allows us to make decisions that hurt other people. And really, when we say things like that to other people, what we are doing is we are answering the why for ourselves because we're not as concerned about the time and the space of what has been lost for someone else. That's why I think it is such a good reminder that, that God is near to the brokenhearted. I think my favorite example of this in the Bible is the book of Job which the first time you read through it, you might be wondering, where is God? Because for most of it, he doesn't show up. And Job starts off in this place of having lost so much and his friends are doing an amazing job. For the first week, they just sit there with him. Nobody says a word. They are just present with him in his pain. And then Job shares his heart and his friends completely lose it. They start trying to correct him. They start telling him how his theology is wrong. But eventually, at the end of the book, God shows up. And he has answers for Job. Maybe not all the answers that Job wanted, 
But the way God is answering the questions lets us know that God was there with Job the whole time. He was giving him the space that he needed to come to terms or as best as he could with the losses in his life. And so if you're in a place right now where you feel like like God is distant and he's far from your pain, I believe that he is right there with you, that he's in that moment. See, Isaiah 53 says that he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Isaiah 53 is about why the Messiah was going to come and why he was going to die. He came to die for our sins, yes. That's usually the first thing we talk about. But he also came to die for our sickness and for our sorrow. And so if Jesus died for our sorrow, he has not left you, he has not abandoned you, he is in that moment with you. And he's not gonna waste it. Now friends, what happened to you didn't just happen for a reason. The reason probably is sin, either yours or somebody else's, probably more likely somebody else's. But Jesus is a redeemer. And so he can take those things that have happened to you, those situations, and he redeems it and uses it for your good and his glory. He's not forgotten your pain. He can actually use your pain to enlarge your soul. In Pete Scazzaro's book, uh, Emotionally Healthy Discipleship, he talks about uh, the imagery of the soul being like a balloon. And when it's blown up, there's pressure that is put on the, on the balloon itself. And when we're grieving, when we're going through pain, we feel that pressure of being expanded. But your capacity is actually being grown. Uh, when my wife and I first started dating, I was a horrible, terrible, awful boyfriend. You can ask her about that later. Uh, I really was terrible. I only thought about myself, what I wanted, what my desires were, um, and she put up with me for far too long. But she eventually did get sick of it, and she broke up with me. Now, spoiler alert, we got back together, and we're, we're married now, in case any of you are, are getting nervous. Um, but during that process, when she broke up with me, I realized what I was losing, what I had been neglecting, what I, what I hadn't realized was actually so much more precious to me than I had ever actually taken the time to think about. And it absolutely crushed me. But I felt Jesus near to me, and really for the first time. And I found comfort in the Bible I read the book of James over and over and over again. I spent more time in those days in, in the Bible than I really ever had uh, at any point in my life. But not only that, as, as the Lord comforted me, as I was able to move forward with the healing process, like he dealt with a lot of the, the junk that I had going on, including one of the, the things that he dealt with was I, I told you as a high schooler, I was doing everything I could to deaden my emotions. What I did not realize at the time is when you try and cut off sorrow and sadness, you're actually capping the amount of happiness and joy that you can feel. For some reason, God has designed our soul so that the depths of sorrow we can feel are equal to the heights of joy and love that we can feel. And God just ripped that out of me. He restored my ability not just to, to cry and to mourn and to be in sorrow, but to feel life, to feel love. And through that process, I was able to embrace what God was doing in my life and fix some things, change my behavior, start to be ready to actually be a good boyfriend and, and, a, and a good spouse. But he dealt with me. 
And I know if you're in a place of pain today, that is no comfort at all. Because we don't see that in the moment. We don't see that in the process. But it's important for us to know. Because God will use even your pain. And the Apostle Paul in the, the book of First Thessalonians says that we don't grieve like the rest of mankind. We don't grieve like those who have no hope. Because we know who the Savior is. We know that, that Jesus has not abandoned us in our place of pain. And that one day there will be no more pain. Amen. And for now, we deal with the tension. But I love the book of Revelation, and the more I read it, the more I see Jesus in it, which is the whole purpose of it, by the way. But I love Revelation 21. And verse four says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away and perfection will come, and the, the kingdom of heaven will descend physically upon the earth, and God will make his dwelling with man again. I believe it's Psalm 58 says uh, something about God collecting our tears in a bottle. And I don't know if it's just poetic or if it's literal, but when I imagine meeting Jesus face to face for the first time, just imagine him pulling out my bottle of tears. Son, I was with you for every single tear. From the time that you were an infant until you passed into eternity, I have kept every single tear. I was with you for every single moment. Every moment of being brokenhearted, every moment of weeping for the, the, the brokenness of the world, I was there with you. I just imagine Jesus embracing me. And for the last time, I cry. But it's tears of joy because I've fully realized the love of Jesus. Now he's never left me alone. And I can even in this moment, because I know some of your stories, I, I imagine Jesus sitting down right next to you and just putting his arm around you and saying, I am here with you. I know that some of you are in pain. I want to invite the worship team to come forward. And I, I just want to have a space for us to, to live this out together for a moment. And so in just a moment, I'm going to ask those of you that are, are in a place of, of grief, in a place of mourning, to take a risk with us uh, and church, I'm going to ask the rest of us to come around those people that are willing to do this. And I don't want you to ask them what's wrong. I don't want you to ask them how they're doing. I just want you to pray over them. Whatever the Lord gives you for them, they don't have to share what's going on for you to be an agent in the ministry of comfort. You just have to be obedient to what the Lord is speaking to you. So if you're willing to be prayed over right now, would you just put your hand up? Are there any of you that are in pain? We've got to keep them up. Keep them up. All right. Anybody else? All right, we got some in the back. We've got some over here. The rest of you, I just want you to get up. The band is going to the band's just going to play some music before we go into the last song. But I want to pray for these people that want to be prayed for. So would you put your hands back up so people can see you? The rest of you will, you, will you get up and surround these people and just pray over them? 